We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Lindsay, are you able to unmute yourself if you have to? I can. Okay, good. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah. Do you want to see if Dr. Pedro is able to sign in? He was, it seemed like he was. I think he's downloading something. I just want to make sure he is. I just don't want to leave because I'm admitting people. I'll be right there. Thank you. Come on. Thanks, Lenny. So we'll wait another minute and then we'll get started. Um, there are some people who are not on mute feel free not to be on mute, but we'll just hear you talking. So if anybody doesn't know how to mute, let me know. I can kind of explain that to you. Think it's okay to get started? Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, we're gonna get started. Uh, I want to introduce um, the people who are doing this forum. My name is Ben Schreiber, and I will have everyone else introduce themselves. We're going to be doing this forum today. This is our second forum we're doing this year so far. The forum, um, we wanted to allow parents and uh, other people in the community to have an opportunity to ask questions um, as COVID and the expectations change uh, as a pandemic continues to shift uh, the needs of our children and the needs of the school as well as the community uh, will continue to shift. And we just wanted to open this up to people, whether it's asking questions about mental health, 
school, life in general. I think, you know, not to speak for everybody here, but um, at least for me, and I've talked to Lindsay about this and Jen, I see Cynthia Skarsner, we've all had conversations with people um, throughout the past few weeks, especially as things continue to shift about, about the future, about, about the shifts in what kids are expecting, what's expected of kids. So we just wanted to open this up and I wanted to allow the people that are helping me run this introduce themselves too. So Lindsay, why don't you start? Sure, I am Lindsay Candela. I am one of the school psychologists here at hand. Um, and I think, you know, we definitely just wanted to provide an opportunity for parents to, as Ben said, ask questions. Um, I think, you know, on the receiving end of here in school, we're seeing a lot more kids with reporting concerns of anxiety and, you know, feelings of sadness and, and how do we support them as things continue to evolve and change is kind of where our goal is. Jen. I'm Jen Holly. I'm the school counseling coordinator. And uh, I would just echo what Lindsay and Ben both said. Um, we're all working as a team to support the students and I'm curious what it will look like when they all come back too, but we're here and we want to know what, um, you know, what we can do and, um, See where we are you know I guess it's kind of day by day but we're, we're we're looking forward to kids coming back so we're hoping that's that's a reality very soon very good yep, yep Dr. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. John Pedro and um, I consult with a lot of school districts uh, throughout the state and um, I love these forums they're a great way for families uh, to get access to some some really good information as I always say I'll, I'll send you all my professional development stuff. To, and a lot of it uh, pertains to parents too. So it's great if a parent wants uh, more detailed information and that answers specific questions, but this forum can do, can do that as well. Um, and, and I'm seeing all sorts of, uh, of things that you guys are talking about in every district from anxiety to school refusal, um, even school refusal online uh, with the uh, distance learning uh, to kids really wanting to get back to school. Um, to the extent where some kids went to school, they started crying because they were happy to be back with their friends. And there's other kids that are crying because they really don't want to be there. So it runs that full gamut of emotions with, the, with this uh, idea. But it, as it comes, I think it's great uh, that, or important that we get prepared for this return. Thank you. And uh, just to let everyone know, we are going to record this. So if people know of other people that have missed this and want access to it, I will um, save it and give it to the principal, Mr. Sayatari, and he can distribute it or we can send it your way as well. Uh, the way we did this last time, which was pretty successful, is we have questions, we have backup questions or questions that people have asked us over the past few weeks, um, which we can always have as in the background, but I'd like to open this up to if there's anyone here who has questions that they would like to start with. I'll give people a few seconds to gather their thoughts. Otherwise we do have questions that people have submitted to us and we've thought of as well. So why don't, why don't we, in the uh, spirit of being teachers, I gave people a few seconds to, to think about it. That's how we're trained. Um, but what, what, what maybe what we'll do is we'll start off with some questions. So one of, one of the questions um, that we've come across, and it was kind of what we talked about um, as we started, um, and I think, I think actually Jen passed this question along to us, is um, what the parents can do to help support the transition. Um, and transition, I would consider whether it's coming back to school more, whether it's talking about coming back to school more, whether it's for kids going back to sports, for um, adults working more out of the house, it, like, like Dr. Peter says, it runs the gamut. And you know, basically what the parents can do to discuss with their children to help them prepare for the ever, the, 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 the continuous changes. So what, what can parents do to help support their kids or what can the adults in the community do to help support the, children, the, the kids in the, in, the, in the community as we go through these different transitions? And anybody can jump in. You know, Ben, I, what I would say the most important thing is communicate. Communicate with the kids. 
And probably most important in light of that is listen. You know, ask the simple questions. How do you feel about going back to school? How do you, you know, my son's elated that sports started up again and he's now running because he's so out of shape oh. and he's, uh, you know, and I've asked him these questions like, and then just listen to what they have to say as, you know, as a parent, uh, you're probably better off just listening because they're not always going to hear what you say, but if they feel heard, uh, they feel supported. Lindsay or Jen, do you want to jump in? I don't want to, I don't want to take over. No, so. I mean, I think, I think definitely listening and, and I think kids um, have a lot to say, you know, and, and they do have opinions on these subjects. And I think it's important for us to have those conversations. Um, I, I think a lot of it too is there's been a lot that kids can't control throughout the pandemic and, and being able to have those conversations surrounding of like, okay, you know, this is maybe what we can expect and this is maybe what we can't expect, but what can we control and what can we not and how to support them through those kind of pieces and being able to kind of realize that this can become part of our new reality and it's okay and it's safe, but kind of giving them those tools to be able to communicate and be open and honest through those discussions. Another, another thing that I've found is parents are on both ends of the spectrum. Some parents are saying to their kids, you need to deal with this, like this is life. And I, I, I highly respect that because kids need, as well as us, need to be resilient. Um, and then there's parents on the, uh, or adults on the other end of the spectrum that are saying, it's, it's so nerve wracking, it's gonna be so hard for you to return. And as, I think you can see where I'm going with this. There's you know, the, the diplomatic middle ground and the way, the way you can do that is to be, is to encourage your kids. I think a good word is to be flexible, that it is hard, but not to put your, our anxiety onto them. Kids are very resilient, probably much more resilient and flexible than, than even we are, not even than we are, than we are. Um, so to be, to teach them that flexibility and to show them and demonstrate that flexibility. Yeah. That's a great point, Ben. And those words control that Lindsay used and resilience that you used are important. And when I said communicate, parents need to be positive. And I think that's true in any context because kids feed off of our anxiety and our worry and they have enough of that of their, on their own. So if you're listening to what they have to say and be positive to reinforce that they're supported, it makes doing things that are stressful and produce anxiety a lot easier. Absolutely. Anybody else have anything to add to that before we move on to the next question? Okay. Does anybody in the audience here have a uh, question that they would like to ask or uh, elaborate on? Give it a couple seconds and then I'll move on to the next question. Okay, um, one of the things that, that, that people have struggled with and that has been out there is, and a lot of questions I've gotten and, and, and my, my colleagues have gotten are, what, what do adults do um, when their children want to stay home? And, you know, whether it be for mental health reasons, whether it be for um, fear of, you know, getting ill, whether it be, you know, there, there's a whole list of uh, reasons why, but what do parents do if the children, if their children want to stay home and not go to things that are relatively in their mind, in the parents' mind, safe? What do they tell their kids? How do they, how do they work with their kids on that? I mean, I think a big piece of it is that some components of, of COVID and, and the way that our system has been formatted, it's become pretty comfortable for some kids to stay home. Um, and so it's a little bit of habit breaking for some, you know, I can speak for some of my students that will check in online and be like, you know, I wanted the extra hour of sleep, you know, and, and pretty soon that may not be a viable option anymore. So I think, you know, how do we support families and how do we support students of kind of breaking some, some new habits of learning that, you know, has kind of transpired this year? 
I think that's definitely a question that I toy with then on top of that, you know, mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's routine that we're, you know, that all of us, um, not just students, but, you know, everyone we're, we're missing. And I think that um, it's going to be hard to get back into that routine. So I think slowly being able to do that, whether Ben, I think you mentioned, you know, whether it's being outside and, and doing an activity or coming into school or whatever it is, but just kind of slowly reintroducing some things that maybe we haven't been doing um, as a family, as, you know what I mean, as, as students, as parents. So I think um, just kind of trying to reintegrate some normalcy as we can, you know, in the pockets that I think that we can would be helpful for students in having that routine. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think when you look at, at our kids, you can't have a one size fits all format. Like Ben was saying, you know, kids are resilient. I'd say push kids. You know, of course they wanna sleep late. Of course they wanna, they're kids. Of course they wanna avoid things or need a mental health day. We all need a mental health day. I could use one once a week, but mm -hmm. frankly, that's not life. And we do have to push the kids. That said, there's kids with anxiety disorders, depression, especially coming out of this thing, social awkwardness, their social skills haven't been used in a year. And we have to be cognizant of that and aware of that and not just say, you know, you're all coming back on Wednesday. Um, but that said, if that's how it goes, we have to prepare the kids for that day and do it ahead of time. Be proactive. Uh, like I said before, there's a, there's a lot of P's here. Proactive, positive, and do, you're doing so before it's Wednesday morning and you're like, let's get up and go to school so that the kids have a time to talk about things and get ready for that. Uh, kind of like exposure therapy, if you will. I found one of the biggest challenges is, is the ambiguity, the, the changes in the environment, the, the changes in expectations, whether or not we could or can't do things. It's constantly on the news. And of course we want our kids to be educated and aware of what's going on with all that said, the kids respond best, and you can you can plug this into almost any sort of discussion we have, kids respond best to boundaries. And I think one of the most confusing and challenging things right now is that amb ambiguity. Do you wanna to go to school? I know you're anxious today, maybe I will have you stay home. And that's there's no wrong or right answer to that. But once you, in your own head and, and with whoever you're, you know, talking to or parenting with or discussing this with or your friends, come up with your rules, come up with your boundaries and stick to it while still be understanding. You can have your, you can have your kids go to an activity that they're supposed to go to, even though they're nervous about it, because that's your boundary. That's what your expectation is, but you can still be supportive of it. And I think, it, I think it's really important. I think kids, kids thrive on boundaries and we're having a little bit of a tough time applying those nowadays because of all the ambiguity. Yep. Anybody have anything to add to that or? No, I think, I think you're right. And, and parents need to be careful of the traps of, of emotion that it's hard sometimes to push a kid who's upset and, or crying. Uh, like I talked about earlier, um, but if you allow kids to stay home, it can get into a really slippery slope where it's much harder to get them back as they put off each day or try to take off a day or two a week. Before you know it, it becomes a lot of days. Um, so it's better to treat the anxiety, the emotion, and, and have a plan rather than just trying to wing it every morning as kids meet with upset, crying, refusing, um, and fear, all of which are reasonable right now but need to be coped with and not avoided. Avoidance is a nightmare. So, so that, I would highlight that aspect to parents who say, well, I'm gonna give you extra days or extra time, just be careful. And I think, you know, technology has been amazing through that, you know, all the tools that we now have, but technology has also made it easy to kind of hide behind at some points, um, you know, of that, like, you know, I, I can't make it to school on my in-person day. It has made it easy to still attend school. So I think we might have more anxious kids pop up, you know, this year, next year, whatever it might be, if technology doesn't have the same role as it does now, you know, and being able to access our education. Um, so that's, you know, definitely something 
to keep in mind of how to support that anxious child and what that looks like now might like make look a little bit different down the road. What about with dogs? <laughs> we're, we're, seeing, <laughs> we're all getting a chuckle out of that. That's cute. <laughs> it's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pedro is not a vet, but you know. Um, yeah. Well, no. <laughs> Pet your dog and uh, and listen to what he has to say. <laughs> um, does anybody have anything um, that they would add to that, or another question before we move on to another? But and I feel free, like I said, to ask anything, anything or everything. This is this is an open forum. I would like to say something. Um, I got involved with that with my granddaughter, with her not wanting to go to school, but she was doing all her uh, remote learning and she was up to date on everything. But we got an email from the teacher saying that, you know, it's early in the year and she's been out so many days and that's not acceptable. So we put it on the school to be the bad guy that, you know, yeah, they're doing remote learning and you're up to date, but there's an expectation that after 10 days that it's not acceptable. So she's been going to school every day. That's what worked for us. And, and thank you. Thanks for that comment, um, because that kind of that goes along with boundaries, using your resources. Um, obviously, the, obviously, you know, your granddaughter sounds like she did. She did well online, but the school you know, had other expectations and really just reaching out. I've had people call me and say, and this, there's nothing to be embarrassed about saying, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I don't want to push it too much because my child has anxiety or they're worried or they're, they have more anxiety now, or they had anxiety before, or they're going through a tough time. And I don't want to push them to go to school, but I think they should but I'm not really sure how to go about doing that because a lot of the responses are, well, my friends aren't going or the team isn't going or different things like that. So I applaud you for, you know, reaching out to the school and sticking with the school and trusting the school to be able to have her go back. And I'm sure I'd be curious, did she, did she appreciate going back after a while? Is she thriving? I hope you say yes. <laughs> She's definitely thriving. Uh, last March, it was, it was horrible last March. I couldn't get her out of bed. I couldn't get her to get dressed. She didn't want to eat. We actually brought her to the doctor. I, I, she was sleeping too much. And they took some blood work and they found that she had very low vitamin D. I thought she needed an antidepressant, but um, no. And um, once she started going back, it made a big difference in her life. It was actually us. If she, you know, she would get up and say, you know, the weather's bad. And stuff like that would see yeah, the weather's bad and you can do it on remote. So um, no, she's thriving. She needs to be with other kids. She really needs to be in school, but it was just easier to just not let her go to school if she didn't want to. So yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. it, it, it you, you said it in a nutshell. It's easier to stay home, but you have to get back to life you have to go to school and get back in the game. Uh, well done. And not not the first person to talk about vitamin D either. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not pushing that. But many and many people. I knew I knew where you're going with that when you said the doctor because I've had so many people say they just haven't been out. They're not getting they're not getting the normal fresh air. And yeah, definitely use once again definitely use your resources whether it's the school, the pediatricians, the anybody and everybody because. There's, this is what we talk about so often, as opposed to using just the news as your experts, because <laughs> they have a little bit of a different agenda. So um, great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody, anybody else wanna share anything or add to that before we move on or anyone have a question? I just wanted to say, we didn't know what the fatigue was about her not wanting to get out of bed. I thought she was clinically depressed but I was happy to see that the doctor didn't do that as a first line. She's not on an antidepressant, but he insisted that she see a therapist and getting the blood work and coming back to school helped her. He didn't just push a pill. And this was the pediatrician. My thought was that she needed a, um, an antidepressant, but she's doing fine without it. And we're very grateful. Yes. I, you know what? I, I love that you said that. Any kids I see, I always run through a pediatric appointment 
before I would even go to medication. Uh, and then I would do counseling for at least four to six sessions because anxiety is the most treatable thing of all. Depression is a little different, but anxiety produces depression. So if you can treat the anxiety first, the need for medication, especially in children and adolescents, to me is very limited. Uh, and when I need it, I need it and it's valuable, but it's my last option. Um, building resiliency is the first, oh, the second. Some vitamin D goes a long way first. So uh, yeah, I always encourage parents, go to the doctor first. You can do it concurrent while they see me and I'll talk to the pediatrician and we'll formulate a treatment plan for you um, that works for your child. Uh, because it's hard to tell what's clinical depression and what's just situational depression, which I think is what a lot of kids are experiencing. And that is much more treatable and does not need medication, unlike clinical depression does, which is more biologically based. And, and not, not to just throw kudos to our district, um, but if you call, whether it's you call the school psychologist, which is Lindsay and Jory, whether you call Jen and, and Cynthia in, in guidance or Liz in special ed or Linda in special ed or, or any of our administrators that are here, it's, it is rare, if ever, that the buck stops there. In other words, they'll, they'll call the nurse. Our nurse is wonderful. They'll call um, the reading specialist. They'll call the parent. They'll say to call the pediatrician. In other words, it takes a village and the amount of collaboration that we've done this year um, when this is lower and it's a little bit easier, it, it's going to be amazing how that collaboration continues because it, it like I said, it is rare um, that let's just say, for example, a parent calls and then that's just it. The guidance will come to me or I'll go to guidance. I'll go to Dr. Peter. I'll go to Linda or Liz or any of our administrators. And it's that's and, and what um, is it? Mrs. Ginty? Yes, you could call oh. me Sue. Uh, what Sue, um, what Sue just gave us an example of is just the collaboration, and once again, not just letting your kids be super comfortable, but reaching out. I mean, we might we might not have the confidence to know the answer as to what to tell our kids, and we reach out, and we, we do that with our own kids here at school, and talking to one another, and reaching out, and getting support. It's really, really hard, really hard. Yeah. I just wanted to say that in my situation, I didn't reach out to the school, but the uh, principal, Catherine Hart from Paulson, reached out to us and uh, she, the teachers had some concerns. So now she's actually going to the guidance counselor and she does a lunch group once a week. And I think that helped immensely. I didn't know you guys had these things, you know, and uh, actually with the, the blessing, what's going on uh, now with the remote is that there, I think there is more communication between the teachers and the parents. At least that's what I'm finding. I mean, it's it's really wonderful. I am so impressed. You guys are great. So, so that, Sue is an actor from Caledonia. <laughs> we did not hire her. <laughs> she she's real. Thank you. <laughs> Sue, Sue is wonderful. I, I, I feel better. I want to talk to Sue uh, <laughs> when I get a chance to to make me feel better. But, <laughs> But one thing she said that I think is important is the, the how to access help because there's so much support. Madison Schools is tremendous. It's the only district I go to uh, these days because they do everything in, in the right manner. And I'm not just saying that because Liz is on the line here. But the fact is, I, um, I can send you, Ben, a parent uh, chronology of how to access help within the school in the community um, and, and on that are what parents can do at home to get their kids uh, ready for returns to school. So you can send it to every kid in the district or every parent in the district um, if you want to. And, 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 and this was um, when we were trying to figure out a forum, we didn't want to, we, we talked more about COVID um, and the different things that you could do to help with your kids. I think it was back maybe in November, I think. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but when we tried to come up with uh, a new forum, obviously we couldn't ignore the, 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 the pandemic, the biggest thing going on in the world. Um, and I posed it to a variety of people and Lindsay is actually the one who came up with um, the question, what do we do 
to help with this transition rather than being reactive and just say, okay, you're expected to come back, come on back. Um, like Dr. Pedro said, some people are crying because they want to come back. I was watching on Sunday morning TV and there was a little girl whose mom told her she's going back to school and I want to say California, I could be wrong. Um, and you know, it was like the girl was going to Disney world. And, and so, so we're going to get that, get but that. we're also, oh. what was that? Um, so it, we're going to get a lot of different reactions and, and adults are going to need a lot of support and your friends are going to need a lot of support. And, um, you know, don't be surprised when people, people will call with questions and you'll, you never think of those questions that they come up with. And it, there's so many challenges out there. So it's glad Lindsay came up with that. Ben, can I ask a quest question that is typically asked? So one thing that kind of leads students to sometimes having this anxiety uh, right now, especially the situational anxiety, is not being organized. Um, so how can I assist with, you know, giving children an ex skills and executive functioning so that way they stay organized because if they're not organized and not ready for class then you're going to get more resistance i don't want to go to class because i'm not prepared so you, can you talk a little bit about executive functioning skills and how we can assist Good question i can start with the back to the p's i talked about positive proactive and then preparation so like you would with any kid or any person, when you're organized, your anxiety goes way down. So I'm a huge checklist guy, a huge calendar guy. Things are written step by step, sometimes almost too much, like 8 a.m. shower, things like that, that really give you a sense of control. Now, kids with executive functioning issues and or anxiety are going to need help with that. And that's where the, the proactive piece of parents come in and schools. As Sue pointed out, the schools are here to help. And for kids with ADHD, executive functioning issues, or just kids that have been out of the game for a while, um, even me getting back, I've left stuff home and had to turn around all the time to, to pick up files or other things. Uh, it's going to take a bit of the time to get back into the swing. But if you're positive and proactive, you can help kids be prepared to that come back to that return. Um, and some of the good uh, uh, ADHD type of things are very helpful in this matter of organization. Having your things all in one place, having your backpacks there, knowing what you need, knowing what you're gonna be doing that day. All of that's done ahead of time. If you're trying to do that at six in the morning on your way to school, that's a nightmare. And the more chaos you have, the less control, the more anxiety. So these things are super helpful to reduce not only executive functioning problems, but anxiety that, that occurs with it. So that's a great point. I'm glad people brought that one up because it's a lot less stressful when you're prepared. And I think it kind of goes for so many of our kids, you know, and, and what came first, you know, did the executive functioning concerns come first? Did the anxiety come breed from that? And I think the more that we can kind of find um, strategies and systems that work for individual kids, the better. I mean, you know, we rolled out Google Classroom and said, okay, it should all look like this, but how one kid interprets how to be organized in that model might be different than another kid and how it works for them in that model. So I think trying to find what works best for your child is, is the best. I mean, I think we can all say that executive functioning and anxiety have been such hot topics for us and how to support students this school year. Um, and it's not one size fits all, you know, so definitely have your child reach out or, you know, reach out to one of us because we've definitely been hitting on many different topics and areas and strategies and supports for all those kind of different domains this year. Um, and again, you know, how to be able to look at and interpret, you know, what's to do and how to organize a calendar and how to break down those steps. Those are all different things that we can help your child with if it's an area of concern. Um, you just, you know, again, like Ben was saying before, let us know, like communicate with us. We're here to, we're here to help if that's an area of concern. I, I really, I really like the idea of um, a lot of times if you're a business person, you might sit down with your child and expect for them to take out the calendar, plug it into their phone, do all these things that are more of a, an adult perspective. And, you know, Lindsay hit on a really good point, letting the kids um, take some ownership over their executive function. I think that's huge. It's kind of like 
practicing putting brakes on a car as opposed to just watching a YouTube video on it. So letting them get engaged, letting them get their hands dirty and doing that. Um, and the amazing thing about this whole pandemic is, is well, we use Google, but the Google meets so that, that some of the kids have really by default have be, have ha, have the opportunity to become super organized. I had one it, in my private practice, I had a student, I, it was a, in my private practice, so there are lots to text me, text me his schedule. Now, now, I hadn't seen him in two years, and all of a sudden, he texted me a picture of his schedule. Now, this is not a person that would write down anything, and they had a detailed schedule, so they learned they, they needed to become more organized because cohort A, cohort B, in school, not in school, go to work, don't go to work, and I thought that was amazing, and I had another another student who had been out for quite some time and I was really concerned how are we going to get back on, on track and he took out his Chromebook that the school supplies pulled up Google me scanned through I mean it was amazing how he was able to navigate through all the things that he would never have been able to do last year before all this happened so to take advantage of all these different resources nobody nobody knew how to use Zoom uh, over a year ago and now it's you know, kids only talk face to face nowadays. It, it's you know, or, or we even do that. Well, I'll, I'll shoot you a Zoom, and it, it's it's pretty neat. Or, or Google Meet. A lot of opportunities out there. Jen, have you um, have not to put you on the spot, but when I, I know that you guys are kind of the hub because you guys know all the kids and and over there in guidance. So when people, um, whether it's parents or kids, um, come to you and are, are behind in school um, and they really haven't been in the past. How, how do you see them? What do you see as some of the, for lack of better words, some of the interventions that have worked during COVID? Like, cause it's different a little bit. Um, again, I, I think like you said, it, it's situational and depending on if students are here two days a week or if they're fully remote or if they're here five days a week. So. Um, we do have resources here in the building, like the Student Assistance Center, so we may use something like that. So um, assigning kind of a smaller study hall with paraprofessionals, that can be helpful. Um, that certainly has been done um, this year. And um, we do have an intern who meets with some of our students who are falling behind. So she, in addition to the counselors and obviously the other support staff, um, will set up individual meetings if we can weekly. Zoom meetings, like you said. So it really depends on the student and the situation. Mm -hmm. um, constant contact with the teachers and just kind of getting updates more regularly, um, especially right. if the students aren't here. So and and, I, and and that's why I asked you because I've seen so yeah. much communication um, among staff, kids advocating for themselves coming in or at least responding. Um, you know, there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes to. Um, keep an eye on the kids that 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 we all do, that guidance does. Every, I know you can go on and make a list of all the things. I, I'm not, I know you're not trying to brag, but I'm trying to brag for y'all, but all the things you do behind the scenes to keep an eye on the kids that we've kind of discovered through having to do this through COVID. And, and, and the teachers have been really pretty unbelievable in terms of um, their flexibility, as, as Sue has said with, with her granddaughter. And, um, you email a teacher, you call a teacher, and we're not asking to change grades. We're asking, hey, you know, we have a human being who's struggling, whether it's through COVID, whether it's not through COVID, what, what, what do we do? And the thinking outside the box is probably, an, we can probably write a book on and make a list of 300 different types of ideas that people have come up with that have been truly just things I would have never have thought of. So the teachers have, are really the, the ones behind all this too. I want to give a plug to the tech department too, um, because they have on their Google classrooms, um, and I believe it's now public access, so parents can access it too. It shows step-by-step -step videos on how to access some of these executive functioning skills that we're talking about. So like for a parent to be able to say, okay, let's go check on your you know, grades in here. Let's check your to-do list. There's all tutorials on how to do that. So that's an easy parent tool um, that you can kind of go through that site and be able to kind of check in on some of those executive functioning skills as well. Mm. They have tons of videos and it's all really good resources of kind of 
step by step. And it's not mom and dad saying how to do it. It's not, you know, it's somebody else saying like, this is a really good resource. You should try it. So, you know, that might be helpful for some families as well. Because people don't know what they don't know. And when we start talking about executive functioning, you know, kids mm -hmm. look at you as what, like, what do you mean? You know, executive functioning is a hot topic. And when, like I said, they don't know what they don't know. So when we start talking about, well, maybe the reason you're not doing this is because you need this skill um, and having access to that, it changes someone's whole life rather than learning always by, you know, learning the hard way, uh, being yeah. more proactive. We also have a, a student study team across the district and every different school level where, where we review students and their progress um, and if there's concerns. So there is that kind of component as well that we're always having those conversations and parents can bring concerns to the student study team through their counselors or, you know, teachers can also bring it um, as well. Even kids have brought up concerns about themselves, you know, that they've even kind of been able to kind of touch down and, and touch base about students and how to come up with problem solving strategies. So there's also that built in support as well. Thanks. Um, one question, and it's a little harder for parents to ask, um, may, maybe once we, you know, they know us a little bit more, especially, you know, with the people that they, they talk to on a more consistent basis here in the school is the importance of parents. You know, there's so much expectations on the parents because they have to be the stable people. They have to have all the answers. They have to know what to say and know what to do and a lot, a lot of pressure, but we don't really we don't really cater um, to ourselves or to the adults um, that we work with, but I have had a lot of uh, encounters over the past few weeks, and it's obvious that adults struggle to figure out how to guide their kids, and that's what we're discussing right now. But any suggestions as to how to how, how what what the adults should be doing to help themselves so that they are stable for their kids and the people in the community? That's a good point. I would say, much like we're doing with the kids, take care of yourself. Reach out to other people, your friends, family, professionals. Uh, there's a lot of people out there to support you. And if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your kids. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for adults to get back into these routines too. Put on, you know, putting on a tie again and, and getting back into the game. It, there are things that you have to, to reach out and get that help for. And I'm going to, I'm going to say this because I talked about communication earlier and I think it's essential that we are talking to kids and, and vice versa, because there's a lot of kids who aren't telling us how they really feel. Uh, they're feeling some deep emotions right now and they're not forthcoming. Like a lot of adolescents, they're holding it in and you'd be shocked if you asked them, how do you really feel about this? What's going on inside? There are questions you might not always ask at the dinner table, but I think we should start asking those questions and get some, some better communication. Same with executive functioning. You don't know what a kid doesn't know. If I said, look, my method is write it down, kids will say, okay, boomer, that's not what I'm gonna do. <laughs> but if they said to me, like my, my kids are in high school, they know how to get on A day, B day, C day with a blue coded red. I, you need a PhD to navigate those systems. And, and, <laughs> and I don't know how to, to communicate that, um, but I can help them if they tell me what they don't know so that I can make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. And often I say, I don't know either. Call your counselor. That's what they're, they're there to help you get through this. As a reminder too, um, the support staff are staffed um, with the school counselors every morning from 7 to 7.30 and 2 to 2.30 every afternoon at the high school using a Google Meet support staff. So if your child's not in the building for the day or they're not sure if they can get a hold of their counselor, that's always an avenue to be able to reach out. Um, it's staffed Monday through Friday, you know, 7 to 7.30 and 2 to 2.30. So we're always there. And we're also going to be doing um, some more check-ins during Wellness Wednesday with different grade levels coming up. So we will be um, letting students know when that is too, just to check in and see how everyone's doing. And, and, and just having been in this field for 25 years, I, if anyone said, what's the greatest thing you could offer? I would say your child on, or your grandchild or your mentor, mentee or somebody you work with, uh, your student, will 
maybe one in a million times after you give some sort of suggestion, say, oh, that's a great suggestion, <laughs> you know, or they'll do the dishes on their own or any, it just doesn't happen. And parents become, adults become, teachers become very discouraged. And one of the greatest, I guess, gifts that, 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 that I could give or that, that we could give is I say to a parent, hey, guess what your kid just said to me? And they're like, they did? Because it was really what you've been preaching to them. So it's, I, I consider it's kind of like insurance. You, you keep asking them questions. You keep, um, maybe not lecturing all the time, but you can lecture sometimes, but you keep asking them questions. You keep offering advice. You keep listening and listening and listening. And, the, and they may say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you know, you're talking to them one-on-one -on -one when you're not their parent. They say, yeah, my mom was asking me last night about this. And I was thinking about this. So you're doing all the hard work. And, and, and meanwhile, like Lindsay or me or Jen or, um, you know, all the people that are, are, are talking to the kids, um, you know, on a daily basis, we get all the, we get all the gifts that you kind of set up with them. And, and you'd be surprised just, there's a commercial and it, and it says, just ask your kid. And um, the kids really do hear you. They're not going to respond the way you want. They're not going to say thank you. But like Dr. Peter said, keep asking about their days and their questions and how they're doing. Yep. Keep, keep asking. And, you know, kids are plugged in with earphones on and onto their phones. Um, you know what? Send them a video. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then they'll have to watch it on their phone. Uh, it kind of goes back. I had, a, I had a patient years ago that I told the same thing for years about how to cope with their anxiety to leave the house. And one time they came in and said, you know what? I did what you've been saying. And I'm like, that's awesome. What made you change? And they said they saw it on Dr. Phil. <laughs> Which, uh, we, 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 they were listening. They do get there. But I do think sometimes you get, you get a little creative so you don't get the one word answers. Um, they just needed an expert to confirm what you were saying. That's all. That's all they needed. Was Dr. Phil. Some, some stranger on TV. <laughs> but, but I do think listening, listening is, you know, not just, it's asking the question, but also letting them know that you heard them. And it's, it's pretty easy to just say, sounds like you're anxious. You know, how easy is that? Sounds mm -hmm. like you're worried. Sounds like you're sad. That goes a million miles, even though you might be like, yeah, duh. People never say that. They say, wow, you heard me. And it, all that is, is empathy. It's, and it's so easy to do. And it goes, and that brings the conversation up from yep, uh, uh, whatever, to more talking. So it sounds like you're anxious. Tell me about that, what, what's up? Sounds like you're sad, what's going on? And you might just get a flood of tears and now you're gonna get the real story. And, and it's powerful and that's how, it's so easy to do. It doesn't, it's not deep therapy or dream analysis. It's just a simple question and listening and telling people how they feel. Yeah, it's it's say, saying to your kids, yep, it's going to be hard to go back to school. Yep. Not it's going to be hard, but you need to do it. That's life, you know, that that kid the kids right. just want to be heard and I, I, that that's perfect. Good point. Good point, Pat. Yeah, no judgmental stuff. Just sounds like you're worried. And then they'll talk. They'll tell you, yeah, yeah I am. Uh, I don't want to do, or I'm sad. I miss people. I don't know what to do all the dynamics that go with being an adolescent or being a person. So I think we, we ran the spectrum from what to do for our kids to what to do with the schools, to how to access the community, to how to help ourselves. It just kind of went along that natural flow. Um, and we transitioned to each different topic. And, you know, I, I do appreciate, we, we all appreciate the different input and people being here, we're going to have this recorded and it is recorded. And as long as I remember to press save, we'll be good. I've been working on that all day. Um, before we go, um, I want to see if anyone has any last second, last minute questions or uh, concerns or comments before we wrap it up. Can I make a quick comment? I just think, you know, um, Thank you for all the people who are attending today. Hopefully, if we go to do another one of these, you can spread the word because I think this stuff is extremely important right now. Mental health is the number one um, 
challenge that we're facing right now during this pandemic. And I also wanted to thank Dr. Pedro, Ben, Jen, and Lindsay for um, having now, this is your second form this year and creating this and putting this together out on your own to support our parents. So thank you for doing this and everything you do every day. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, and we're certainly open to suggestions for future uh, topics uh, for these forums. So any last comments before we uh, and the forum. Last comment I have is I'm going to send those resources out. I'll send them to Liz actually uh, right now, and then they can be available for parents or staff uh, at any time to access. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. 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 Thanks again, everyone, for attending, and um, feel free to reach out to any of us and um, have a great rest of the day. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.